Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our sixth environmental justice rulemaking stakeholder meeting. For those of you that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting before, my name is Olivia Glenn, and I'm our Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Justice and Equity here at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. We are convened to hold a button up meeting today as a summary of the next steps from all of our previous focused stakeholder discussions. This is building on a platform of the passage of the environmental justice law back in September of 2020. The law does not go into effect until we adopt rules. And tonight's discussion is a continuation of that process that gets us toward rule completion. If you missed any of the past meetings, you can find that information on the Office of Environmental Justice website at nj.gov slash DEP slash EJ. And before we move forward, I just want to note that tonight's meeting, as all the others, are being recorded. And by joining, you are giving consent for this meeting to be recorded. You can go to the next slide, please. We just want to note that there is closed captioning available on the Teams platform. You can access it by clicking on the ellipsis on the Teams window on the banner that goes across the top. And when you click on the ellipsis, there is a drop down menu with an option for turn on live captions. And if you simply click on that, you should begin to see live captions at the bottom of the window. Go to the next slide, please. Our rules of engagement for this evening um, are as the same as they have been before. We want to ask everyone to please remain on mute if you are not speaking. It of course helps us to hear as well as to maintain the integrity of the recording that we're trying to produce for the public record. When you want to speak during the facilitated discussion, please use the raise hand function. And you will find that in the bar going across the top there's an emoji with a smiling face with the hand like this. And if you click on that, it will give you a drop down menu and you'll see a hand. Just click on that hand and you will be able to raise your hand and we will answer uh, your hand at the appropriate time. We ask that has been done in just as has been done in all previous meetings that we treat everyone with respect and that you limit your comments or questions to the topic being discussed. And I will note that our agenda tonight is very, very robust. So if you see something that has not been raised, I would suggest that you wait maybe until the end because it may come up in a future discussion and we want to make sure that we get through everything really thoroughly tonight. We want to ask everyone to limit their comments or questions to two minutes and you will see me physically raise my hand as you approach 90 seconds. Again, I will just tell you that tonight we have an awful lot to cover. We're going to try to address as many hands as possible, uh, but we may need to limit discussion on some specific topics to make sure that we get through the full presentation. And just as with all past presentations, this one will be recorded. It will be on the Office of Environmental Justice website, and you can follow up with us um, to submit questions through a survey as well as through our EJ rulemaking email address anything anything also if you put it in the chat we will make note of it we will follow up with you if we're not able to address it on the record verbally this evening and again just underscoring underscoring that tonight's meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on the website after this session concludes you can go to the next slide please and here is our agenda for tonight it has nine parts and under each of these nine parts, we want to hit three topics. So first, to do a stakeholder process recap, to do an overview of the environmental justice law, to talk about facility and permit definitions, geographic points of comparison, environmental and public health stressors, EJ impact statements, and a sample run through of an environmental justice EJ statement, actually two run throughs. And then finally, to talk about compelling public interest. And within each of those topics, we will cover what we have previously presented, 
the potential direction for rulemaking, as well as any questions or comments that you have on that particular topic. So again, just please absorb this agenda. For tonight, we'll also place it in the chat just so that you know what topics will be coming up in what order. Um, so if there's something that we don't address, um, you can know, you know, you can raise it at the end, but also have a sense of when things will be coming up in their respective orders on our agenda. The next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is just a recap of the six meetings that we've held. We've been engaging in these discussions. I can't believe we've been in these, these discussions for eight months now, going back to October 22nd of last year. And you'll see the respective meetings that we've held throughout the course of the past several months. So tonight, these are all the topics we look forward to covering with you. And at this point in time, without further ado, I want to put you right into the hands of my able and capable colleague, Sean Moriarty, who is now a fellow deputy commissioner at the Department of Environmental Protection. So Sean, I pass it over to you. Thank you, co-deputy so commissioner Glenn. I appreciate that. And thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. This is our sixth meeting, which seems incredible. Um, I just want to start by saying that um, we are significantly um, better off for having engaged in this level of, of dialogue and um, and discussion with you all. Um, the ideas that we had for this rule at the beginning of this process um, have have evolved and are um, much, much better and much, much, much more informed um, th thanks to this work. So we really do appreciate everybody's time, um, their willingness to engage and all the information that they've provided us. Um, just to kind of double down on what Olivia has said, we're working on putting kind of five meetings worth of information in front of you tonight. It's a lot. It's a lot to digest. It's a lot to download. Um, we tried to put together as complete a presentation as possible um, so folks will have an opportunity to look at that after this meeting um, and digest it. We will take written comments. We'll make ourselves available to the extent this turns into more of an information session as, to, as opposed to our typical back and forth. Um, we're committed to continuing this conversation and getting feedback from you all um, as we continue to write the rules. So I don't want folks to feel um, like you're missing out. If you don't have an opportunity to speak today, we will make ourselves available. We will make time um, to ensure that that happens. Some of these topics I'm going to go through rather quickly. Um, others we will take more time. Um, so here we go. So we go to the next slide. So just to start, um, to the extent anyone has not been with us um, for any previous uh, meeting, and just to give people an idea very quickly about where we are, um, I want to give a brief overview of the law. Um, just to provide some framing and some context to what you're going to see for the rest of the, the rest of the evening. So the environmental justice laws we've talked about recognizes that pollution standards are often formulated based on the effect pollution has on general population spread over wide geographic areas, and that they fully to, they fully they fail to fully consider um, localized impacts, which has created pockets of high pollution and concentration of certain pollution generating facilities and predominantly minority and low income communities, and disproportionate impacts to their health, their public health and environment. So we have in front of us as 232, the environmental justice law. Um, the first step to understanding that law, of course, is to understand the intent of the legislature. We can do that by looking at the declarations which are listed and summarized here. I won't go through each of them in, in tremendous detail, but I will point out um, several things. One, mirroring what we've just talked about, that historic um, disproportionate siting um, of facilities in low, low, in, low, income, in, low income communities and communities of color. Um, as well as the legislature finding that the legislature finding that this has poses a threat to the health, well-being, and economic success of our most vulnerable residents. Next slide. Also indicating, the legislature is indicating that no community should bear a disproportionate share of those adverse economic and public, excuse me, environmental and public health consequences that accompany our, the state's economic growth, and that is ultimately in the public the public interest for the state where appropriate, and that's where the rules come in to limit future placement and expansion of such facilities in overburden communities. That's what our charge is from the legislature. Um, now that we've kind of refreshed ourselves on the premise, we'll just talk a little bit very quickly about how it applies, hearkening back to the three prong test of applicability. First, we're looking at whether facilities are one of the eight facilities listed in the bill. Again, I won't read everything in detail, but we're talking about major sources of air pollution. We're talking about solid waste facilities. We're talking about resource recovery facilities, scrap metal facilities as well as medical waste incinerators, except those attendant to hospitals and universities. We're also looking at any of those facilities seeking a specific permit from the department. One of the subset of permits 
listed in the bill, which include our hazardous waste, excuse me, solid waste and recycling permits, our development permits, wetlands, CAFRA, flood hazard, water supply, water solution permits, air pollution permits, and pesticides. It also, the bill also explicitly excludes authorizations and approvals necessary to perform radiation or minor modifications of major source air permits that do not increase emissions. And the third question we ask ourselves in this situation is whether the facility is proposed to be located or is located in overburdened community. Next slide. Legislature does the job of defining overburdened community for us, um, meaning any census block where 35% of the households are lower, low income, which is defined as at or below twice the poverty threshold as determined by the US Census Bureau. 40% of the households qualify as minority, which include residents who identify as minority or members of a state recognized tribal community, or 40% of the households in that given block group have limited English proficiency, which is defined as lacking an adult that speaks English, quote unquote, very well, according to the Census Bureau. Again, highlighting here is we have in the past use of the word or, which means that a block group that meets any, any one of those conditions is considered overburdened, as well as the focus on a census block group, which is the most finite unit of neighborhood census data available. And that certainly is relevant when we look at what types of data we can use to identify the stressors that we'll need to analyze as part of this part of our ultimate regulations. Next slide. Now, just kind of a reminder of what it looks like um, when you plot out the OBCs within our state, the overburden block groups, and the coverage of, of population at, at a little bit over four and a half million people. And you can see those block groups spread across across the state. You can also see how those block groups meet any of the individual criteria, including where those criteria overlap, where you might have one minority and low income, um, limited English proficiency and low income and, and the like. Um, also a reminder, next slide, I think, that all this information can be found on the environmental justice website, which includes an Excel spreadsheet listing all the overburdened community block groups with the town names, PDF maps, and our favorite thing, um, our GIS tool, which allows you to search for an over, overburdened block group based on an based on an address level, and which we will build um, to make a ro more robust and publicly facing tool that will allow folks to see a snapshot of the stressors in a given community um, when we reach the point of publication, uh, when we reach the point of adoption of this ultimate rule. Next slide. So once we determine applicability, permit, facility, and block group. Um, the, the law requires us to analyze the environmental and public health stressors, many of which are defined expressly in the bill. These include environmental stressors such as concentrated sources of air pollution, mobile sources, contaminated sites, transfer stations, and other solid waste facilities, recycling facilities, and scrap yards, and point, sources, point sources of water pollution. Those one thing that's always notable here, which I do point out, um, is, the pre, is the fact that the bill recognizes or the law recognizes that certain of those facilities because of their because of their historic abundance in overburdened communities are stressors. The second thing we look at are uh, public health stressors, which are defined as conditions that quote unquote may cause potential public health impacts, those including asthma, cancer, elevated blood lead levels, cardiovascular disease, and developmental problems. The key being may cause here, which allows the department to consider present conditions um, where the data dictates appropriate and gives us more latitude um, and not needing to look at um, necessarily specific data about cancer rates or asthma rates, which can be difficult to obtain due to confidentiality concerns and maybe difficult difficult to manipulate down to the block group level that we need in order for that data, data to be, um, be relevant to our analysis. Next slide. Um, once we've identified those stressors, the law requires the department to determine whether those stressors are quote unquote higher than those born by other communities within the state, county, or other geographic unit of analysis determined by the department. We'll go through this in more detail as we move forward. The question that always comes here, and I imagine the ultimate question folks are going to ask ask us tonight and, and be wondering after we get out of here, is how is this all going to work? How are we going to go through a comparison? What we've laid out here is what we've shown you previously, a high level overview of the process, including an initial screen, the environmental justice impact statement process, as well as on the next slide, the departmental review. We'll, fr we'll flesh this out in significantly more detail um, as we go through the evening, but again, I think it's worth refreshing everyone's memories on this specific point as we walk through e each concept again, because it will ultimately inform the process. As, as Olivia indicated, we will be going through um, a couple of examples to try to illustrate as best we can at this point what this will look like and what facilities um, will be expected to do um, when they're subject to the environmental justice regulations. 
so we can move forward now into the topics. So the first thing we talk about is kind of where we started um, about covered facilities and what the department's potential approach to do that is. Um, as we just discussed probably 45 seconds ago, the bill lists eight, eight types of facilities. Um, it lists them broadly. Um, and many, many of them have analogs in their regulations, but some don't. And some even where there is an analog, it's not a perfect analog. So our approach is where, where we can to incorporate those existing definitions within our regulations, often our solid waste regulations, and make certain modifications that we determine necessary to meet our statutory charge. We're going to go through each of one, each one of those um, quickly. Major sources of air pollution. Uh, first and foremost, the the primary or not primary, the the initial um, listed listed facility in the bill. Um, the legislature did the job of defining this for us. Um, we don't intend to make any modifications to the statutory definition, effectively incorporating um, both the definition and the um, the specific thresholds and pollutants that are considered major source um, pollutants under under applicable law. Incorporating definitions of major source as well as major facility from the Air Pollution Control Act rules. Next slide. Moving on to resource recovery facilities. Um, our, our potential proposal here um, is to simply define resource recovery facilities as they are set forth in our solid waste rules, um, providing here a definition for reference. This would be consistent with what we talked about previously in terms of what our, um, what our approach here would have been. Um, folks will have an opportunity to, to review and think about that definition can certainly provide us comments both before and after proposal. Incinerators. Um, so incinerators are defined on their solid waste rules. Um, you can see the, the, the hallmarks of that. Um, what we did here um, is modify this slightly to ensure that we're including the other materials addressed by the statute. The underlying solid waste rules do not include sludge or medical waste. But the but the bill or the law requires us to um, to consider sludge incineration as well as medical waste incineration. So we would have included those, or or will include those specific materials as part of a definition adopted from the solid waste rules for incinerators. Moving on to sludge processing facilities, this is where we start to have to be a little bit more creative um, in our in our rulemaking. Um, sludge processing facility is not specifically defined in the regulation. Um, we do have a definition of sludge incorporating incorporated from the New Jersey uh, from the Egyptes rules, um, and we would be modifying those things slightly um, to ensure. Excuse me. We'd be creating a sludge processing facility definition that would cross-reference the Egyptes permitting um, regulation definition. Um, it would include necessary cross-references to exist to address existing disposal methods, landfill incineration, sewage treatment works. And again, creating that definition of sludge processing facility. Go to the next slide. OK, sewage treatment plants. Um, again, we drew here from the existing concepts in our Egyptes rules, um, largely the definition of treatment works and sewage, sewage, sewerage entities, um, where the EJ statute def de refers to capacity of more than 50 million gall gallons a day. After discussion with our Bureau of Surface Water Permitting, um, we determine that capacity is not always a known number, while permitted flow is defined in every Egyptes permit and is ultimately a similar concept. So here we're considering that the re that the regulation should require should relate to permitted flow as defined under our Egyptes rules of more than 50 million gallons per day. That ends up being a more easily um, definable and usable term, which we think hits the statutory. Um, intent to ensure that we're getting the appropriately sized sewage treatment plants. Next slide. Transfer stations and solid waste facilities, a little bit more straightforward here. Um, we would be adopting in whole from our solid waste rules, um, both similar in concept to what we what we discussed at our at our um, facility definition meeting. Next. Um, recycling facilities. So for recycling facilities, we really wanted to stay as consistent as possible with the existing solid waste regulations, which define recycling or reclamation facilities. Um, we would note here, and you can see the definitions on the screen that we that we are looking at. We would note here that ultimately this this um, definition will be broad enough to include Class A recycling facilities, but it will not otherwise modify the underlying permit requirements for for Class A recycling facilities. 
the goal here not being to bring solid waste recycling facilities under the existing rules, but to ensure where they are getting, otherwise getting a permit that is subject to the environmental justice regulations, that they would be subject to its requirements. So if there are additional stressors that are associated with, with a Class A recycling facility, we would be able to address them through the EJ rules. Scrap metal facilities. Um, the department does not currently regulate the operation or otherwise define scrap metal facilities under the solid waste, waste rules. We do define uh, scrap metal as set forth in those regulations, and we would need to create a definition for scrap metal facility. As you can see, scrap metal is defined um, in a certain way to include these bits and pieces of metal, um, and we would essentially be adopting that rate, that definition and creating a separate definition of scrap metal facility, which would refer to a facility that receives, stores, process, processes, shreds, or recycles scrap metal. Essentially, um, you know, creating a, creating a definition that matches with the legislation but uses existing law, so we're not um, we're not ending up inconsistent. Landfills is next. Um, landfills would be are both are de defined under the solid waste rules. We would be defining them to include both sanitary landfills as well as hot hazardous waste landfills. Again, we think meeting the definition, the uh, intent of the legislation. That brings us to the end of that part. Um, did promise to go through that quickly because we have some more meaty meaty topics at the end here. Um, and we'll go through this quickly as well. Permit definitions. So um, similar to our approach for facilities, we will be looking at permit definitions and the thresholds under the existing rules and looking to define those accordingly. Um, a couple of notes here um, in terms of what the statute, how the statute applies. Um, the language specifically relates to individual permits and does not include, as I said earlier, authorizations or, or approvals necessary to perform mediation. And again, does not include minor modifications to major source, or as we've we've talked about them, Title V permits that do not increase emissions. I'm just going to take two seconds here just to catch my breath before we get into geographic points of comparison. So I just wanted to note to uh, everyone who we have participating on the call that we did tonight's call different than we've done past stakeholder meetings. In the past, we've done business and industry in the morning, and then environmental justice advocates, environmentalists, and community representatives in the evening. We also held uh, two separate meetings uh, with municipal and county officials, but because this is a button-up meeting, we wanted to bring everyone into the same meeting at the same time to get the same update. So just for your awareness, uh, there is a suite of representatives on tonight's call. So I just wanted you to have that in mind um, for your awareness. And certainly if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free uh, to use your raised hand function and we can take a few at this time. And we'll also peruse the chat as I understand there may also be some questions there, but any hands to be raised at this point? Okay, let's, let's work through the geographic point of comparison. So as we mentioned earlier, um, the department's required to determine whether environmental or public health stressors are quote unquote higher than those borne by other communities within the state, county, or other geographic unit of analysis as determined by the department. So as we as we covered previously, um, we looked at several different options. Um, we looked at, at the state, we looked at the state excluding the non overburdened areas. We looked at the county, we looked at county excluding the non-overburdened communities, um, excuse me, excluding the overburdened communities. Uh, and we also looked at a hybrid of approaches, um, which is most like the uh, US EPA's approach, who uses multiple geographic areas. We also looked at the different comparison percentiles, um, the 50th percentile, so you know, kind of on average, um, and, and how that might connect to higher than in the regulations, as well as the 80th percentile, um, which is what the EPA uses as a flag for initial screening. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the orange um, the orange highlights indicate the, the potential direction for the rule, which is a hybrid approach like EPA, as well as the 50th percentile, which we think most matches higher than in the statute. I'm just going to walk through um, a couple of a couple of slides just to show you what the maps look like. Um, so here we have a comparison um, of the state and county using the NADA or National Air to Toxics Assessment Cancer Risk for diesel. Um, including those including those OBCs in the comparison point at the 50th percentile. So this is similar to what we saw last time. We looked at a little bit of a different flavor of NADA data. Um, but you can see here that um, 
particularly on the right, um, several blocks in the generally lower stress counties um, end up covered, um, where several block groups in the generally higher stress counties, where you're looking at a county, a county point of comparison, end up not covered. So Hudson, Middlesex, Bergen, Union, um, as well as you can see again that donut hole in the northeastern part of the state. We think this, and with this, what we think this analysis highlights is that there are block groups where the stressor level is higher than the state but lower than the county because the county already has higher stressor levels. Conversely, the opposite shows up in comparatively quote unquote cleaner counties with lower stressors, stress, stressor levels than the state as a whole. When you go through the stressors, um, there is this, we see a distinct lack of uniformity statewide in comparing the county and stressor and county and state levels. And you would see that if we were to do to do either of these um, and include the OBCs um, in that comparison, um, we'd be covering between 60 and 70 percent of the, the block groups statewide. Next slide. Move on to two, two additional examples here. Um, these show your state or your county um, excluding the OBCs. So that is effectively taking your overburdened communities, removing them from the point of comparison and comparing a particular block group to all of the other block groups that are not um, ones that meet the, the demographic criteria set forth in the legislation. Um, what you see here is similar that due to lower stress, stress levels, but, but due to lower stress levels in the non OBC areas, um, we cover a larger percentage. Uh, state increases from 70 to 83 percent, while the county increases from 62 to 70 percent. Again, showing that same lack of uniformity that we saw on the prior slides, the same um, you know, issues that we see in terms of certain areas not being covered due to the geographic point of comparison. The last slide we have here shows what the, the data using the hybrid approach, again, the lower of county and state, and that shows both including and excluding the OBCs in the comparison. You end up with coverage between um, 80 and 90 percent um, and, and avoiding exclusion of the OBCs in the north and south that would fall out if we use the either either of those criteria. Um, again, recognizing the, late, the lack of statewide consistency when making a state or county comparison, we are likely to move forward with the map on the right, which is the 50th percentile, the lower of county and state, excluding the OBCs in the point of comparison. We ultimately believe that this is the fairest and most equitable approach. We think it recognizes the strong correlation between our statutory demographic criteria and the environmental and public health stressors, as well as the need to ensure equity for individuals living both in comparatively more and less stressed counties. Um, as we move forward, we'll talk about how we will fine tune this analysis to do our best to continue to match up that demographic criteria with present stressor conditions. So this is ultimately the first level analysis and there is more to come. Moving on to a conversation about environmental and public health stressors, this is certainly one of the biggest, um, if not the biggest topic um, that we went through. Um, and this is the, the work here is certainly a, a product of a lot of work at the department to identify these, to build up data sets and ultimately to put this um, at the end of this process into something usable for everyone. Um, as we talked about before, the law requires us to consider the new or expanded facility stressors together with the existing stressors affecting an overburdened community as part of our review. Um, this makes, again, identifying what those stressors are a key part of the assessment of permitted activity and its impact on an overburdened community. One thing to note here as we go through this, there's likely to be a, a broader list of stressors for the first le level of analysis as to whether a community is overburdened under the law with a smaller subset of stressors that might be more appropriate to ask facilities to assess their contributions. Also, the list we present here can't be exhaustive um, and the regulations will need to recognize that reality. Allowing room for other relevant data regarding stressors the department would eval evaluate, validate and potentially consider as other relevant information in a given review. So you might remember back in March, um, we walked through how we generate what we were calling our brainstorming list of stressors. We looked at our past efforts um, that we conducted, including our 2009 preliminary screening, screening method to estimate cumulative environmental impacts, a similar effort we conducted in 2012. Um, the stressors discussed in our EO23 guidance, furthering the promise, shouts to Olivia on that, um, and other tools that provide similar data um, like EPA, EJ screen and Calenviro screen as well as input from the programs and input from our stakeholders. Um, we have narrowed that list now down from over 60 um, to 31. Um, and you'll we'll walk through each each of those stressors over the next few minutes. Um, that list has been narrowed down considering some of the some of the following criteria. 
um, first alignment with the categories in the environmental justice rule. Those are those categories of stressors we've talked about a couple of times now, concentrated sources of air pollution, contaminated sites and the like. We've also considered um, and spent a lot of time considering data availability and data quality, as well as the appropriate geographic scale and the ability to quantify that data. This data is only useful to us if it's available statewide, can be used on the geographic scale required by the law, and is, and is quality data. So we do have some limiting factors here, um, and we will be working to, um, to continue over, over some period of time uh, to continue to develop better data, and if necessary, to amend these, amend these lists at, at some future time. But this is the list we have now based on those criteria. We're also considering the marginal value of that. What I've said uh, publicly, I think, at one of these meetings, as well as what our team has talked about, is we're looking for the minimum number of stressors necessary to conduct this analysis. The number of stressors necessary to accurately identify environmental and public health stressors in a community, um, and not looking to include information that doesn't prevent doesn't provide um, that good additional marginal value. We're not looking for a list of 100. That's why we've whittled it down to something we think is a little bit more useful. As we move forward, um, that still may result in some overlap in the data we use to better define our stressors. So, for example, uh, mobile sources might overlap with sources of air pollution, both of which may be relevant as conditions that may cause or potentially cause impacts such as asthma. So when you see something in a particular bucket, as we've done just for framing and explanation today, um, it shouldn't be considered uh, to be a limiting factor in terms of what that particular stressor might relate to. You also might notice some obvious overlap between the environmental stressors and facilities that are subject to the law. Um, and we do take that as recognition again that these pollution generating facilities are when concentrated in a, or in abundance and overburdened communities are in and of themselves stressors. As we move forward, um, we are further evaluating these stressors with our program managers and subject matter experts, and we're going to perform extensive sensitivity analysis on the combined stressors to make sure that final set provides that value that we talked about and doesn't end in, in overcounting of particular stressors. So without further ado, let's start with one of the big ones, the top, the top of the list, um, concentrated sources of air pollution. So you'll note on this slide, and those that follow, um, for reference, we're tracking two well-known tools, the ones that we've talked about many times in this particular um, forum, EPA's EJ screen, as well as Cal Enviro screen. Um, which use similar stressors in many instances. So you'll be able to determine whether we're using the same stressor or something different um, for your own reference. So here we've identified strict six stressors in this area. Two of those are focused on criteria pollutants that New Jersey continues to struggle with in terms of attainment and maintenance, those being ozone and PM 2.5. While the state is in attainment for current PM 2.5 standard, this pollution is a key indicate, indicator of diesel emissions and black carbon and a greenhouse gas pollutant. In addition, um, the Biden EPA is set to reevaluate re the PM 2.5 National Ambient Air Quality Standard to determine if it is protective enough of public health. And for our, our indicator here, we're considering days above that National Ambient Air Quality Standard as a stressor. Three of these stressors are linked to NADA data. We talked about national air toxics data, both cancer and non-cancer causing emissions. The two cancer causing emission stressors look at diesel specifically and then at emissions with diesel emission, excuse me, at and then look at it with diesel emissions removed. Uh, the 2014 data and NADA data assessment is the most recent and includes emissions, ambient air concentrations and exposure estimates for about 180 of the 187 clean air act, clean air act toxics or HAPs plus diesel particulate matter, again, diesel PM. For about 140 of these air toxics, those were health data based on those with health, health data based on long term exposure. The assessment as estimates cancer risks from the from the potential for non cancer health effects or both. This includes non cancer health effects for diesel PM. The NADA does not include eight, eight air toxics in the latest assessment because either no emissions data was reported for them in 2014 or the available data wasn't reliable enough to make a, emissions or health health related estimates. Our final air stressor here in this category is the density of permitted air sites in a block group. Um, that that draws from the law um, and considers effectively, as we said, on a density level, how many of these particular facilities are concentrated in a particular overburden, overburden block group. You can go to the next slide. We're looking at mobile sources of air pollution. Um, we've identified four specific stressors here. 
Um, first, mobile sources. Um, excuse me. First, mobile sources represent the largest source of air pollution in New Jersey. Cars, trucks, buses, off-road construction vehicles, locomotives um, are all considered mobile sources of air pollution. And while emissions from these individual vehicles are relatively low, it's the abundance which creates problems. So that leads us to our stressors. The first two we look at are traffic related, one specifically related, related to truck traffic, and a second that covers all vehicle traffic. The catch-all traffic stressor speaks to overall vehicle emissions, including ozone, PM 2.5, and greenhouse gas precursors. The truck traffic stressor looks more specifically at diesel emissions in the community, which we know is something of, of high concern for folks as we've learned through our, through our stakeholder process. The third mobile, mobile source stressor looks at all rail, rail traffic in a block group, recognizing that that has potential, potential impacts. And the final mobile source stressor looks at goods movement from, from it excuse me, goods movement as it from a source perspective by showing the density of warehouses and other large ship shipment facilities in a block group, including these facilities, another indicator of potential truck traffic and attempts to fill any gaps that might be presented in the truck traffic data, while also speaking to other quality of life stressors such as dust, odor and noise um, that is similar to, way the, to the way the traffic stressors approach things. We have three stressors that we're considering for point sources of water pollution. Um, the first looks at surface water quality through the lens of non-attainment for designated uses from the department's integrated report. Designated uses being things like fishing, recreation, and drinking water. This is a similar approach to how California looks at these things. The second looks at the presence of CSOs in a block group. Um, combined sewer overflows are specifically called out in, in the statute and are accounted for here. Finally, the last stressor looked as, looks at the, the density of Najipti sites. Those are point sources of water um, discharge in a block group. And that's similar to the stressor that looks at the density of permitted air pollution sites, um, as we discussed previously, and tracks with the legislature's um, determination that these are things we need to look at. Our solid waste stressor looks um, more specifically at the density of waste facilities, including transfer stations, recycling facilities, and incinerators within a block group. However, unlike air and water density stressors, this one is weighted by permitted tons of material per day, thinking that that, that, that tonnage has a, has a um, direct correlation or relation to the level of stress that a given community might bring to a, bring to a, excuse me, a given facility might bring to a community. Stressors from solid waste facilities can include air emissions and water impacts, but are also largely related to increased truck and rail traffic, odor, noise, and sometimes light. Some of these stressors are addre addressed in the, solid, so in the facility's solid waste and air permits. However, even when incidents, incidents raised by communities can't be verified or violations, they can be a nuisance and a stress on the communities. We're also looking at scrapyards, which are called out specifically in the, in the legislation. While not all scrapyards operate this way, if, done, if managed improperly, they can result in contaminated soils, groundwater, and surface water. Um, as well as releasing refrigerants containing fluorocarbons, a powerful greenhouse gas into the air. Stormwater management is essential, as well as potentially noise and um, fugitive emissions. So we'd be looking at scrapyards, a scrapyard stressor that identifies the density of these sites per block group. Contaminated sites. Again, called out specifically in the, regula in the law. Um, the core stressor for contaminated sites is the density of our known contaminated sites list in a block group. Our KCSL includes cases in the state where contamination of soil and groundwater has been confirmed above applicable standards. The, K, the KCSL may include sites where remediation is currently underway, required but not yet initiated, or has been completed in, conjunct, in conjunction with the issuance of institutional controls. For KCL, KSCL sites where remediation has been completed, but there are ground, groundwater or soil does not ultimately meet the requisite, requisite standards, restrictions are put in place on the site and the area is identified through a couple of ways. One being a deed notice that is added to the property's title when contamination remains above residential unrestricted soil, soil standards. It, it ultimately requires consent and specifies the location and contamination of cons concentrations, as well as how they must be controlled, maintained and monitored. That notice is intended to inform prospective holders of the interest um, about that residual contamination, as well as the requirements and the obligations that they take on it by ownership. Similarly, a classification exception area or currently known extent 
are areas where groundwater quality standards have been exceeded and remain exceeded. Um, these notifications ensure the, the use of groundwater in the area is restricted until standards are achieved. Um, for these sites, we have areas that are delineated. We're using the percentage of acres of a block group with restrictions. So while exposure risks and pathways have been eliminated um, on the last two stressors, um, we're considering those as potential stressors in other ways as well, um, including by operation of the use restrictions and potential impacts on property values and other quality of life issues. Moving on to things that may cause public health issues, moving on to our um, our public our public health stressors. Um, we can we have and continue to work closely with our partners at the Department of Health to evaluate health outcome data that might may relate to environmental exposures. However, as we've indicated before, due to confidentiality concerns, I think this is the point point where everyone thinks about those HIPAA forms that they signed to protect their privacy um, and protect the release of their health data when you visit a doctor, as well as it, potential issues with statistical stability um, and working with those numbers on a smaller scale down to that census block group. Some of that data that may not be currently usable in the way we need it to be in order for it to be reliable um, and useful in this particular context. So while we'll continue to work with Department on this uh, Department of Health on this evaluation, we are targeting several stressors that meet the definition of the stressor under the law as they may cause potential health impacts. First, we're looking at the density of all the facilities identified in the reg in the bill. Um, on a block group level to provide a sense and scope of the cumulative stressors in the community. We know that living in close proximity, as recognized by the legislation, um, can lead to, to environmental and public health stressors from truck traffic, dust, odor, noise, um, as well as the emissions and other, um, other aspects of operations. Um, secondly, we're looking at dr drinking water quality, um, which is evaluated using a number of MCLs uh, maximum contaminant limits, treatment techniques, and action level exceedances, um, and the violations of those over a three year period for a service area covering the block group. We're also considering the density of facilities in a block group um, that report extremely hazardous substances above a certain threshold and therefore present an ongoing, a potential ongoing public health or safety concern. Again, abundance of these facilities potentially causing stress on the community. We're also looking at the age of housing particularly at those home, homes built prior to 1950. Age of housing is typically included as a surrogate for elevated child blood lead, since old paint was high in, in lead in those times, and paint and dust from paint and sur painted surfaces are a primary source of lead exposure. We're also considering an absence or, or lack of environmental or public health benefits as potential stressors. These could include open space, tree canopy and per pervious surface, which all can contribute to quality of life and a better public health. For open space, we're looking at a population or, or acreage of publicly available recreation open space within a 10 minute or one quarter mile walk of a block group, recognizing the lack of open space as a stressor. A 10 minute walk is, is widely considered um, an acceptable indicator of the availability of open space to any given individual. We're also looking at the USDA's Forest Service, um, which has good tree canopy data, and we're working with the subject matter experts to develop a, a lack of tree canopy stressor, as tree canopy is important for cooling, helping to reduce air pollution, as well as certain quality of life benefits. Impervious surface can cause stormwater runoff, contributing to water pollution, as well as increased heat and flooding, and we're looking at the percentage of impervious sur surface in a block group as a stressor. Many of these stressors also connecting to another one of our large priorities, which is climate change, the heat island effect, and what that does, um, how that disproportionately affects folks in overburdened communities where they don't have green space, they don't have places to cool off, they don't have places to be outside. Um, finally, we're looking at a flooding as flooding as a stressor, using available data to provide a snapshot in time of current flooding conditions. And we're continuing to evaluate how we might be able to consider future flooding impacts from climate change ultimately aligning the stressor that would be here with what we'll do under the NJ Pact rules, which recognizes um, the potential increases in precipitation and sea level rise and working to match those up. Moving on to, to stressors that may cause public health issues. These are our social stressors. The Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention defines social determinants of health as conditions in places where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health and quality of life, risks and outcomes. Overburdened communities may bear 
social detriments to health in addition to the environmental stressors, and both should be considered when looking at a cumulative stressors on a community. The final five stressors here, the ones we're currently considering, look at common social stressors that can exacerbate environmental impacts. These include poverty, unemployment, education, minority status, and limited English proficiency. Certainly noting here, the three of those five criteria are the OBC criteria in, in the EJ law, and we will again be conducting an extensive sensitivity analysis on these to determine the appropriateness of their conclusion to ensure we're not double counting, but again, recognizing the correlation between these specific um, demographic criteria and stressor levels in New Jersey and elsewhere, we think it's appropriate to work through that um, through that analysis. So we're in that next at a, a, um, another place to pause just for a second as we start working through the environmental justice impact statement and permitting. If anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand. And just a note for those who are calling in on the phone, if you want to get off of mute, you can press star six if you would like to add a comment verbally. Okay, we're getting a few hands now. We will start with Julia Summers. Good evening, Olivia. Um, I am trying to figure out as you screen for facilities that qualify, must a facility that qualifies be one of the eight facilities? And is that established in the law? Yes. Yes. So that's that that goes back to the three prong test of applicability. So you need to Correct. be specifically identified um, facility seeking one of those environmental permits as well as seeking seeking to be located or located in overburden communities. So a warehouse would not qualify. Um, from a permitting perspective, no, but we are looking at it from a stressor perspective. Uh, I m multiple stressors, but if if it doesn't apply this, that was my question. Sure. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, next is Jonathan Smith. Hi, yes, I just had a question about slide 23, which I think, just to clarify, I think that slide is saying that um, a resource recovery facility is excluded from the definition of incinerator, but I just want to clarify that resource recovery facility would still be included in the definition of facility um, since the law uh, yes. defines facility to include resource recovery facility. 100% correct, John. Would be covered. We just were we just were pointing out that there's a, that that those those types of facilities could be considered um, similar, but they are two separately defined facilities covered by the law. OK, thank you for that clarification. Absolutely. Appreciate you asking. We do not want to leave that unclear. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, next, we have Nancy Griffith. Uh, hi, Sean. Uh, I was wondering, you, you use uh, only can. Oh, no. Nancy, I think you um, inadvertently muted yourself. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about the public health indicators. You use cancer as the only one. And I've, I've been looking a bit at public health indicators across the state, and they have very different profiles. Uh, for example, cancer is all cancers, which is probably different from what you're looking at, is worst in the uh, southern counties. And uh, emphysema, for example, I think in Warren County. Uh, so uh, if, if you look at, so might it be, it might you be missing public health impacts in certain counties if you only look at one indicator? Yeah, so I think what I and and I, I may be I'm not the data expert here. And and if there's further if there's further detail needed, I'll have you talk to Steve Anderson on this. But my understanding, based on what we're doing here, is we're we're specifically pulling out cancer risk, specifically cancer risk from diesel and excluding diesel, while also having the NADA non-cancer risk um, indicator. So I think what we're doing is trying to highlight the highlight cancer specifically while also having the non-cancer risk indicator 
um, to cover some of those other those other health impacts that would be of concern. Um, but certainly willing to discuss that further with you. Okay. Yeah, it'd be interesting to hear a little more about how you get the non-cancer risk. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, okay, thanks. Absolutely. Okay. Um, just as an approach to keep things moving tonight, as often as we can, if you type a question in the chat, we will try to issue a written response in the chat. Um, and if you want to say something verbally, you can just raise your hand. Uh, so we'll give you one more moment to raise your hand, or if you're on a phone again, um, you can press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. Um, we're making great time. So we are on schedule, uh, surprising. OK, so now we'll move on to, to kind of some of the nuts and bolts and what this actually looks like in, pro in, um, in process. So we've laid out um, a lot of the background in terms of how we would approach this. Let's talk about what we actually do um, in terms of looking at a permit and making some assessments. So um, starting with what the statute requires from an applicant, it requires the applicant to prepare an environmental justice statement that assesses the potential environmental and public health stressors associated with the proposed new or expanded facility or with the existing major source permit as applicable, including any adverse environmental or public health stressors that cannot be avoided if the permit is granted, and the environmental or public health stressors already borne by an overburdened community as a result of existing conditions located in or affecting the overburdened community. So that is our charge. That is ultimately the scope of our review. Let's talk about how we get there. So we laid out earlier um, that three-step process. This is our attempt to flesh out that in a bit more detail. So here is how we would, uh, would potentially be um, approaching that first step, that initial screen. So what we're doing here, um, recognizing that, you know, it's important to aggregate um, these stressors in some in some way. What we what we've determined to do is is look at a way to to define and determine a combined stressor total. Uh, it's not the flashiest name. We'll probably work on a better one, but for the purposes of tonight, we'll use combined stressor total or CST. Um, what you do to determine that CST is you determine if each stressor in an overburdened community is higher than the most protective geographic point of comparison, state or county, non OVC. That harkens back to what we've talked about already and that list of 31 stressors. So you're going to be able to go through that list of 31 stressors. It's going to be publicly available. It's going to be in that data, that data tool. Um, you're going to be able to look at a block group, look at an address. You're going to be able to pull it up and there's going to be a chart that's going to show you what the stressor levels are. Um, you're then going to then there's also going to be the ability to sum the number of stressors in that particular block group or at that particular location that are higher than the geographic point of comparison for an OBC in the um, for the combined stressor total. So the example we have here is if 18 of the 31 stressors in an overburdened community are higher than geographic comparison, the total for that the, the combined stressor total for that OBC is 18. So 18 out of 31 or higher. That represents your present condition. You then determine if the, the combined stressor total is higher than a geographic point of comparison. So it's effectively running that same statistical analysis on the on the, the combined stressor total that you would have on each individual stressor. You determine if the count the OBC CST is higher than the most protective geographic point of comparison, again, state or county, non-OBC at the 50th percentile. That's second level statistical analysis. So if an OBC CST is 18, and the geographic point of comparison, which will be um, will be static, is 15, then the OBC is subject to adverse cumulative environmental or public health stressors that are higher than the geographic point of comparison using the language of the bill. That's how we intend to, to address that specific statutory charge. So what do you do with that? You've now determined that a specific, um, you've determined the specific combined stressor total for a block group and you're looking at that in comparison to the combined stressor total for all non overburdened communities within the state or county, the lower of those two. The applicant would then, if that CST is lower than the geographic point of comparison, so you're in a block group that is subject to certain stressors, meets the demographic criteria, but ultimately those stressors um, on average and aggregated are lower than the, than the point of comparison. And that's a particular situation. And here we're going to offer two specific paths. The applicant compares an environmental justice impact statement, conducts a public comment period, and holds a public hearing in the overburdened community to assess whether that facility will contribute to existing environmental and public health stressors, such that it creates stressor levels that are higher than the than the appropriate geographic point of comparison. What, the, what we intend to do here is again to work to match up stressor levels with the demographic criteria, but also to ensure 
that facilities are not creating more overburdened communities that with higher stressor levels. That, that can't be an outcome of the legislation. It can't be an outcome of the regulations. So we need to have something in place to ensure that facilities that are located in these particular block groups that are below that number um, do not create additional overburdened communities, do not raise stressors to the point of creating disproportionate impact. So if the answer is no, if, you're, if that particular facility is not going to contribute in a way that creates higher stressor levels, then we've avoided a disproportionate impact and the applicant is authorized to move forward with environmental permitting without additional conditions. We will have conducted a public, a public process. We will have engaged directly with the community, but we will not be requiring additional information from an applicant. They will go forward with their permitting and we will seek to put in place um, measures and conditions in accordance with our normal permitting process that are protective of public health. However, if yes, if you've assessed your facility and you've determined that your contributions to the to those stressors are going to result in a combined stressor total that is above the geographic point of comparison, then there's more work to do. So where CS, CST combined stressor total is or will be made higher than the geographic point of comparison, you'll prepare an environmental justice impact statement plus supplemental materials. Again, workshopping some of these terms. We've gone back and forth. We landed on supplemental materials. Um, if that's not clear, we'll certainly work on that. Um, you would conduct a public, a public comment period and hold a public hearing. Now, again, this does not need to be in addition to. The facility can make an assessment to, to go through the, um, through the EGIS with the supplemental materials up front if you're close. You'll be able to make those assessments early on in the process using the publicly available data. We're not intending to build more an unnecessary process here, but we are intending to give a path um, for those particular overburdened communities as defined by the legislature that do not have those those higher stressor levels. So you have a public comment period, you hold a public hearing in the OBC, and you'd assess how the facility will contribute to existing environmental public health stressors in the overburdened community, and you'll assess your contributions to stressor levels that are already higher than the geographic point of comparison, and again, ensure that that facility will not create new stressor levels that are higher than the geographic point of comparison. We're not looking to create any stressor levels or any OBCs that are more stressed than their neighbors as part of this process. We're looking to ensure that that does not occur and ultimately to better conditions in the overburdened communities that are facing stressor levels that have combined stressor totals that are above the geographic point of comparison. We can move on to the next. So we talk about what those requirements are for environmental justice impact statement. Um, this tracks with the law again. You're analyzing your environmental and public health stressors already borne by the OBC. You're determining which ones are higher. You're analyzing the potential stressors associated with the facility, new or expanded or existing major source. And you're looking at an an analysis of those individual stressors and how those the environmental and public health stressors associated with the facility may cause or contribute uh, to stressors in the overburden community that are already higher. If the applicant seeks to demonstrate that a new facility meets the, the compelling public interest standard, which we'll talk about a bit later, um, the facility would need to identify how that facility serves is the type that serves a compelling public interest in the overburdened community, including any additional measures the applicant would propose to protect public health and improve baseline environmental and public health stressors in the overburdened community. We're also, we're also looking at ways to ensure that notice is given through multiple channels to reach individuals in the community. We heard very loudly and clearly, I think across the board, um, that newspaper notice is not going to be sufficient to ensure that the folks most in need of this information have it in their hands and are able to react to it. So we're working on how we're going to be able to ensure that occurs. Down at the bottom here is just kind of an example of what something could look like. We haven't put any numbers in here. We'll work on some numbers as we go forward. Um, but you know, there could be a, this is a chart that would list an individual stressor, put out, list out what the geographic point of comparison in is, what your existing conditions, your OBC, whether that particular facility is going to increase or change that, and whether that impact is not is avoidable or not. When we deal with the EGIS plus supplemental materials, again, that being the requirement for a particular facility where the combined stressor total is higher than the geographic point of comparison or where its operations will cause the, com the combined stressor total to be higher, um, the applicant would need to identify um, the steps it would implement at the project site to avoid causing or contributing to stressors already borne by the OBC, as well as additional elements or points of analysis um, from other existing impact analyses, which we ran through before, um, you know, ex executive summaries setting forth de demographic, economic, and physical descriptions, 
a detailed um, and clear description of the facility and the operations, including mapping, environmental summary and assessment, health summary and assessment, and alternatives analysis, including reasonable sign, uh, design, siting, and operational alternatives, as well as a statement of environmental justice issues, including justifications and conclusions. So that's kind of an idea of what the paperwork looked like. Um, let's talk about how some of these things, uh, let's talk a little bit further about some of these things would apply. So, um, when we get into the departmental review, um, it depends on whether a particular facility is new, expanded, or seeking a renewal, um, where disproportionate impact exists. We've looked at how that how that would be determined. The department may apply conditions to a permit for the expansion of existing facility, for the renewal of existing facilities major source permit, concerning the construction operation of the facility to protect public health. So we're dealing now with expansions and Title V renewals. I will talk a little bit about how we how we might define those on the next slide. So we have new versus expansion or renewal. I think this largely tracks what we talked about before. Don't expect any surprises here. Um, new facilities or newly cited facilities are ultimately changes in use of an existing facility. So if a facility changes its use from one to another, um, we're gonna consider that facility to be new. Um, expansions would include expansions to the footprint, footprint of a particular facility, um, expense, or, and, as well as expansions that would increase stress or contributions of the existing facility while continuing ongoing operations. Now, we don't think this expansion would include um, changes to operations that strictly um, are strictly to reduce stress or com contributions. We think that's likely to be um, likely to be counterproductive, but we would tend to um, to look at that narrowly to ensure that the, those do reduce stress or contributions. Um, this is not a trade off situation. And then we would look at renewals as the continuing continuation of existing operations without increases. Again, highlighting the statutory exemptions here. Um, which include minor modifications to major source permits um, for activities that or improvements that do not ultimately increase emissions. So now we get to step three, departmental review. Um, so this is this is how we would partic this is how we would potentially approach the different types of um, of permitting um, permitting situations the department would face. Uh, first for renewals. We'd be asking facilities to propose measures to avoid their contributions to the individual stressors in OBC, looking at that on an individual stressor basis, where those, those individual stressors are higher than the geographic point of comparison. Where avoidance is not feasible, first again asking for avoidance, um, we, would, we would require the facility to minimize contributions to individual stressors in the overburdened community that are higher than the geographic point of comparison. And we're going to work to include objective measures for minimization um, things we've mentioned before, back to best available control technology, state of the art um, control technology. We're looking at what, what if any of those might be appropriate. We do aim to, we do aim and believe that um, objective standards are going to be beneficial for everyone in this particular situation. So where they are appropriate to put in place, we will. Um, but when you're looking at facility-wide contributions, there may be instances where um, we're not able to identify that, um, and we'll need to look at those on a case-by-case -case basis for expansions. Um, we would, we would be following a similar paradigm with a little bit more at the end. Um, so first, proposing measures to avoid contributions to stressors in the OBC. Second, where avoidance is not feasible, again, minimizing contributions to individual stressors in the OBC. Um, and the third thing we're considering and looking at is whether additional feasible conditions should be put in place. Um, and those would go in this order. Again, only after you have not, after you've gone through a, an analysis of avoidance and minimization for your expansion would we look at um, potential con potential conditions to reduce like stressors from offsite source in overburden community, reduce other stressors from offsite source in the overburden community with a preference from the highest to lower stress lowest stressor levels, and we will show an example of this to try to put something um, something uh, hypothetical but more real in front of you, um, and then potentially things that provide a net environmental benefit that improves baseline environmental or public health stressors in overburden community. Again, I think it's important to note here that ultimately the department does not have authority to deny these expansions. So we're looking at ways that we can condition them to improve public health, to improve environmental conditions, um, ultimately to have some level of uplift in communities um, while minimizing direct impacts from these facilities best we can. So let's try to let's try to talk about a couple of examples here. Hopefully this will be helpful. Um, it's, the fir it's our first time talking this thing through publicly, so if we miss the mark, I'm sure you will let us know. Um, so first, Yes. So, so before yes. you do that, yeah. we actually have two hands that are raised that have been up for a while. We so don't want people I just, to get tired. 
<laughs> Let's see. Um, the first is Natalie Augusto Filion. Hi, and thank you, um, Olivia. You uh, answered my question in the chat. Um, just for folks on the phone, I wanted to ask that you sort of summarize briefly the comment about density and the analysis, how the analysis is being handled in um, any of the stressor, stressors where the indicator is defined based on density of a given um, type of facility in an overburdened community. Right, absolutely. That is definitely a great point that uh, the people who are on the phone cannot see the responses that we're putting in the chat. Um, so Natalie asked a question a little while ago, um, seeking clarification on what we meant by the use of the term marginal value on one of the slides earlier. And so just to put it simply, what we were looking to do uh, with the stressor layers that we are including in the analysis, we wanted to make sure that we weren't being redundant in the choices of the stressor layers that we used. So we were really just looking to be really efficient and really effective with the layers that we chose um, so that we don't put too much in there that's saying the same exact thing. So for each, we wanted each layer we consider, each stressor we consider, we want to make sure that it adds marginal value. That was the first thing. Um, and then the second was a question about density. And so I want to thank uh, Steve Anderson, who is one of our remarkable team members who gave us a very clear scientific definition uh, for this question. And so the question regarding density, um, our response was our method for density takes into account sites near the block group. It uses a three mile search radius with a kernel density function that gives facilities closer to the block group more weight. So that's um, our answer to those two questions. And uh, for the others, we'll continue to put them in. And I think for the sake of time so we can move through uh, these examples, we can even consider um, emailing out uh, some of the things that are not visible in the chat later. I don't I don't think that that's a problem at all. But thank you for always thinking about those who are on the phone. We appreciate it. Absolutely. And I'll just add there's I was just having an opportunity to look back at some of the questions. Um, in the chat and some of them were about multiple languages um absolutely um i should have i should have mentioned that um in regard to multiple channels um, we're not just talking about um about the form but uh, excuse me the format but the form of those notices making sure that folks in individual um, communities who speak different languages um are able to understand and and, and get the benefit of those notices so we will be um, putting in place um, a regulation that calls for um for an analysis and robustness in those terms as well. So I appreciate people pointing that out and I apologize for the oversight. We have two other hands. Uh, one is from Nicole Miller. Hi, hello. Hello. Sorry, it took me a minute to like figure my, find my mute button. Uh, thank you. Uh, for this series of meeting. Um, my question, similar to Natalie, uh, in the chat I had mentioned, I had asked about the census block groups and sort of adjacent um, block groups. Uh, I'm in Newark and especially down in affected wards, the South and East Ward, uh, it can vary drastically um, from one block group to the next, uh, what the, the, density, the density is. Um, so I'm just wondering how are, it says the answer, uh, Ms. Glenn did give an answer. Um, I'm just wondering, is there is there no consideration given for the impact area? So for truck traffic, um, truck flows in and out, for example, air quality, which doesn't stay within a census block group, uh, those kinds of effects. Uh, uh, just to clarify that question, that's all. Sure, that's a, that's a wonderful question, thank you. So I think there's two ways to answer that. First, um, our specific analysis, um, and our ability to condition permits is connected to a facility in or proposed to be located in a particular overburden block group. So, you know, if if you're looking at a particular block group and it doesn't meet the demographic criteria, we're not going, we're not able to um, to address permits in that particular block group um, under the environmental justice regulations. However, when we're looking at things that impact those block groups, I think when you look at the data layers we have. Um, it's it is it is in some in some ways about facility density in a particular block group when you look at some of this but when you look at some of the traffic layers 
um, and some of those health indicator layers, um, you know, the NADA data, that's going to be a little bit broader and that's going to address conditions in or near block groups that would affect the public health and environmental conditions in specific. So when we're thinking about the block group, we are thinking as broadly as we think we can under the legislation, but we are ultimately limited to block groups that meet that demographic criteria. I hope that answers. Are the, are the facilities required in their impact statements to take that, that uh, so sort of adjacent block groups, the impact on those block groups into consideration in their impact statements? Like a full area, for example, of their impact, not just on the particular uh, uh, block group where the facility itself is located. We have we don't have that specifically determined yet, but we'll we'll consider how we would address that. I mean, I think there are some limitations in terms of our statutory authority, but we'll consider how we might address that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, next is Toby Hanna. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Sean. Again, thanks so much for running this series of meetings, I, and I'm amazed at the the job you've done with synthesizing all of this into uh, into a long presentation tonight. You're doing a great job, as always. I I wanted to go back to slide 55, Sean. You mentioned sure. uh, expansion of footprint. That's the first time I'd heard that term, and I just wanted to know if you can explain that a little bit further what you mean by that is that specific to a title five facility or is that something more general are you talking about physical footprint or I don't know more I think, yeah i think we're more, term yeah so so expansions under under the statute is broader than the title fives right title fives are only uh, renewals or are limited title fives but expansions are any of those specific facilities um i think what we're talking about um, expansion of footprint. We're talking about the footprint of operations, right? So we're talking about conditions that um, that are going to affect stressor le stressor levels um, in particular communities. Um, I don't think it's it's meant to get at something that's completely unrelated to stressor levels. But um, I think we're you know we're going to take a careful look at um, at that definition and how how it would specifically apply to make sure that we're getting at the core of what we're trying to do which is to to track and address um, stressors in the communities and not get at something that's um, you know unrelated so right has, has to be stressor related yeah. okay yeah thank you sean absolutely thank you toby and uh natalie did you raise your hand again i did thank you um i don't remember the the, the terminology that was used, I think it might have been um, stressor 19. I was trying to take notes, but there's a there's a lot of information. <laughs> Again, I just wanted to repeat the prior, prior comment um, about um, the, the yeoman's effort of synthesizing all these many meetings. Uh, it was the one that had to do with like extraordinary um, pollution exposure. And I yeah. wanted to call out specifically to build a little bit on, on the cold comment earlier with respect to the transportation um, of certain kinds of pollutants. I'm curious if there's um, a methodology that's being used for uh, particularly um, dangerous uh, chemicals that are transported through overboarding communities in the case of like a spill or things like that and how that would be treated. Thank you. Yes, no, that's, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. So, so yes, um, we're talking about you know those facilities that um, that store and and you know bring in extraordinarily um, hazardous uh, materials. So those those are governed by our our, our largely governed by our, our uh, Toxic Catastrophe Prevention Act group. So we have you know we have in place um, you know restrictions and and um, disaster prevention plans on those particular facilities, but we also recognize that you know similar to these pollution generating facilities that if many of those facilities are located in a particular block group that that can be a source of stress and ultimately a source of um you know of danger so we're trying to capture that um we're also going to be looking um, very shortly at our tcpa rules um and um we've been having some particular discussions on how we might be able to uh to better some of those conditions to ensure better protections so i think we're gonna we're gonna look to include that um as a stressor in this particular um, instance, as well as taking a fresh look at our rules to make sure that we're addressing um, those types of concerns. Thank you. Absolutely. 
Thanks, Natalie. And I think for now, the last hand that we're going to take is Natalie Griffith, so we can actually move through the examples. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, Nancy, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, I, I may just have misunderstood something. And by the way, thank you so much for this great summary. I mean, it's, it's amazing that, what you're doing. But uh, I, in the computation of the CST for the geographic unit of comparison, um, how do you compute, a, well, when you compute a stressor, you're comparing a census block to the geographic unit of comparison, but when you compute it for the geographic unit of comparison, what are you comparing that to? The geographic unit of comparison? So that's that's basically the, um, like the, I'll use the, the non, the non, the lawyerly term, right? The average of that particular stressor in the state. So the 50th percentile level of that particular stressor in the state. Or the county, the lower of the two. So you'd be looking at all the non-overburdened block groups in the in the state, looking at the information available for them on any of those particular stressors, and then you'd be looking at what that 50th percentile number is for that, and you'd be comparing that individual number to what's present in the particular block group that you're looking at. Then you oh. would sum those up. But sum the second up. step is yeah. to compute a CST for the yeah. geographic unit of comparison. Yep. So what what are you comparing that to? Okay, so in that situation, you would take all of you would you would do that, do the statistics as we like to say mm -hmm. internally, do the statistics on that, and then you would sum up, um, you know, what an average block group, an average non overburdened community in the state or county, what their what their combined stressor total is. So it might be 13, it might be 15, it might be 18. So the average block group where someone might live that doesn't meet the demographic criteria would have this specific number of stressors that are above that average. For those block groups and then you would compare that number to the you combined would, number for the obc you take all the non-overburdened block groups in the state yep. and compute their stressor levels and average that yep okay. and then you add yeah and then you you see for for a for a um for a given block group for an average block group how many of those stressors are above average so it's like an average of the average and then you compare that to your overburdened community so okay. it's the it's essentially the same it's a it's the same it's the same statistical analysis that 50th percentile lower of county and state that you apply to an individual stressor you then apply to the total number of stressors okay okay thanks so much clear as mud i know i know well no i mean i, I can see what you're doing yeah okay. so thank you well i appreciate the questions because i think the questions are going to help a lot of other people too so all right so uh, shall we get back to it? So let's go through a couple of examples that maybe will uh, either illuminate or further confuse the issue. I hope the former, if we end up in the latter, please let me know. So um, let's run through a couple of examples of how this process that we've talked about a bit might work. So um, we have run through example one. Um, so this is an applicant seeking to renew a Title V, um, or the permit for a Title V facility in overburden community, right? So this, um, in this particular situation, it's a renewal. And we put, we've just picked out some stressors from our list just for um, just for illustrative purposes. So don't take this as being um, being exclusive at all. But let's say that particular facility, when you look at its its operations, um, might have stressors related to PM 2.5, truck traffic. Um, there might be stormwater that relates to confinement sewer so overflow. Um, they, you know, surface water quality, impervious service. So they, in this particular situation, it's a renewal. Um, that facility is not going to increase any of these stressors. Um, it might decrease some of those stressors through upgrades to control technology or operation, operational modifications. We'd love to see that, um, and that is a possibility. So what do you do with that particular thing? So we'll, maybe we'll try to um, try to illuminate a little bit of what, what Nancy was asking. So um, step one in this situation, you go through your initial screen. So you take your combined stressor total for this particular block group, this hypothetical block group, um, is 14. So that means it's a 14 out of 31 stressors in this particular block group are above the lower of state and county at the 50th percentile. In this particular situation, the geographic point of comparison, so again, the average of that average of a block of a non overburdened community in the state is 16 in this example. I'm not going to, I'm not saying it actually is 16. Again, we're just making up numbers here just for illustrative purposes. So your combined, your combined stressor total in this situation is lower than the geographic point of comparison. So where does that lead you? That leads you to that first step. Of your environmental justice impact statement process, where your combined sewer, combined combined sewer, combined stressor total is lower than the geographic point of comparison, so the applicant would prepare an EGIS, 
conduct a conduct a public uh, comment period, hold a public hearing in the OBC, and it would assess the whether a facility will contribute to existing environmental and public health stressors, such that it creates stressor levels that are higher than the appropriate geographic point of comparison. Again, if it doesn't, in this situation, it's a renewal. It's not going to. Um, it avoids a disproportionate impact, and the applicant is authorized to move forward with environmental permitting. Um, if yes, the applicant would if if that was if the answer was yes, it would have been required to complete those supplemental materials. So here we have a renewal of the Title V permit in an overburdened community that um, is not subject to stressor levels that are higher um, on a, on aggregate and average from the state or county. Therefore, that particular facility moves through a, uh, a, 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 a an environmental justice impact statement process that um, has public public participation, explains to the public what's, what it's doing, but ultimately doesn't result in additional conditions because it's not increasing stressors in a community that is not overly stressed in relation to the rest of those communities. So you can see on the next slide, which is kind of a little bit of an illustration here. This is what, you know, what a part of an environmental justice impact statement could look like, um, you know, with a table just kind of demonstrating these things, we hope in a way that would make sense to folks. Um, the alternative here, of course, is if that combines, combined stressor total is higher than the geographic point of comparison. So if that, um, if that number, if that uh, 14 was a 17, which is above the 16, then the, then the facility would go through the avoidance and minimization analysis we discussed already. Um, and then we would walk through how that, we could walk through how that looks um, in the context of a renewal. So we'll go through a renewal now, um, which shows that some of those particular stressors might have been, might be, might be, um, might be increased in this particular situation. So here, our second example um, is where a facility is seeking to expand, let's say an existing solid waste facility located in a Burton community. And that facility might increase some of these stressors. Again, trying to use some of the similar ones that we talked about already. Um, it might increase PM 2.5, might increase truck traffic. It might have some impact on, on combined sewer overflows or surface water quality. Um, it might impact lack of tree canopy or impervious surface using contaminated sites here. Not likely to impact that, but a good background one to be able to show how we might walk through this analysis of what a particular, um, a particular applicant might need to do. So again, we go back to step one. The initial screen. We would look at our combined stressor total. In this particular OBC, the combined stressor total is 18. Again, looking at the geographic point of comparison, which we had indicated was 16, the CST is now higher than the geographic point of comparison. So now you're kicked into the environmental justice impact statement plus the supplemental materials. Um, so you'd have, a, you'd have a public comment period, you'd have a public hearing, and the facility would assess how it will contribute to existing environmental public health stressors, and it will assess the contributions to stressor levels that are already higher than geographic point of comparison, and ultimately ensure that the facility will not create new stressor levels that are higher than the geographic point of comparison. Let's talk about what that might look like. So this again is this chart that we that we showed you before. This one different because this one has this was an expansion, the situation where um, some of those particular um, stress levels might be in increased by the expansion. So what we've done here um, is just put some numbers in. These numbers are not what these numbers will look like. They're they're uh, percentages and and they're 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 uh, you know, fractions and decimals and all these things that, that are too hard for a lawyer to explain. So I'm just going to use big round numbers uh, to try to help people to understand something that's difficult for me to understand. So here you have a chart that shows what those particular stressor, le stressor levels are. Um, so for PM 2.5, your geographic point of comparison, again, your lower, your lower 50% count your state is two. In the OBC, that existing level is three, so that's higher than. Truck traffic, similarly, 10 over seven. Um, combined sewer overflows, in this particular block group, there's a density of one where, let's say, the average, which this won't be accurate, is zero. Um, surface water quality in this particular block group, the geographic point of comparison is, is six, where your existing condition of the OBC is four. So that's lower than. Um, contaminated sites, um, higher. Lack of tree canopy, higher. Impervious surface, higher. And what you see here is an assessment of what those operations look like. So the expansion in this particular situation is expected to increase PM 2.5 and truck traffic. They want to increase the, 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 the facility wants to increase its operations. It wants to increase um, its throughput, which is going to result in additional truck traffic to and from the facility. And it's going to result in ultimately an, an addition of PM 2.5 to the environment. That could come from truck traffic, could come from on-site operations, come from a lot of places. You need to look at how that, how that plays out. You also have lack of tree canopy and impervious surface. The facility might think that um, it wants to build a new driveway or wants to create a new parking lot. And as part of that, it might cut down some of the trees that are on site and might put an additional impervious cover. Now that 
where these stressors are higher, that would result in an increase um, in those stressor levels. But potentially those, those impacts are avoidable. So we could talk a little bit about how that might work. Um, so let's walk through that. So, you know, so your PM and your truck traffic could be addressed. Um, you know, you'd go through the go through the analysis. Um, you would go through the avoid, minimize, and then offsite analysis for your expansion. So we'd start with avoid. Look at those particular stressors. We got our PM, our truck traffic, our tree canopy, and our impervious surfaces. Those are the ones that are being uh, potentially being increased. So you could avoid. How could you avoid that? Instead of cutting uh, cutting down trees, you could make no change. You could plant additional trees. You could reconfigure your operations such that um, that you're not resulting in a loss of tree canopy. Instead of paving a new new parking lot or driveway, you could make no change. Um, you could build it using using non impervious surface or so permeable pavers, or you could remove impervious um, impervious uh, surface somewhere else elsewhere on site, ultimately en ending in potentially a net benefit to impervious within a given community on site, directly connected to your operations. The second question we'd ask then is to minimize. So, if you, so let's say you can't you can't completely avoid by operation of your um, of your project um, the increase of truck traffic. Well, you could consider an electric fleet. Um, you can consider state-of-the-art best available control technology on your operations. Now, there might be particular instances where um, the particular um, applicant doesn't control all of its customers. It doesn't have the ability to control all of the truck traffic that comes in and out of its particular site, which might end up in an increase. So it can't avoid. It might be able to, it might be feasible for that, um, that operator to electrify its on-site equipment, but not be able to electrify all of the equipment that comes in and out of its site. In that situation, we're looking at the feasibility of minimization as opposed to avoidance. And then we would be looking at what potential other um, other reductions a facility could contribute to, starting with our um, starting with our hierarchy. So like kind reductions. So um, could it facilitate electrification elsewhere in OBC, in the OBC, um, at another facility, at you know, some sort of transit use within the OBC. Um, could it reduce other stressors again going from highest to lowest? So if you look back at that chart, um, some of the higher stressor levels in this particular OBC are from impervious, lack of impervious cover, lack of tree canopy. Um, could you address a contaminated site or, or um, contribute to addressing a contaminated site? Could you contribute to the reduction of stormwater in a way that you would, you would lessen um, the need for CSOs within a particular community? And then third, condition to be considered would, a net, would be a net environmental benefit. Um, are there other stressors that could be addressed in the community here? Um, surface water quality is the other stressor that was on the list. Could you could you can, could you improve that in some way? Um, you know, that's kind of how the how we could walk through that particular analysis, how it could kind of play out um, when you look at individual stressors. Um, we have about a half hour left. Um, there's a couple of hands up. Maybe it makes sense to uh, take a quick break here and see if folks want to weigh in on this particular topic. Yes, Michael yes. has had his hand up for a while. So, Michael. Yes, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, uh, just as a question, um, will an advocate for the applicant be assigned by the agency to the uh, application? We're going to we're going to process applications through our office of our office of permit navigation. We're looking to um, increase staff in that particular um, office and each each environmental justice application, each one that is um, within a particularly ones that are within an OBC where the combined stress total is higher um, will be will be watched after and cared for by a particular individual or a number of individuals within the within the department to ensure um, that those that that um, that the analysis done by the applicant is is clear, concise, clear and complete. Um, and to ensure that any conditions that we, the department deems appropriate are accurately reflected in, in any ultimate permitting decision. So yes. So that would be an advocate for the uh, applicant. An advocate for the well, I mean, I wouldn't say advocate for the applicant. No, I mean there will be somebody assigned to the particular um, application to ensure that it is it is addressed in accordance with the regulations. But you know, we, we don't advocate for anyone internally. Okay, and. The average time period foreseen for an application and uh, approval or denial would be approximately how long? Well, the statute sets forth particular timelines. Um, I don't have those in front of me at the particular moment. I don't think we have a specific um, a specific time. I think a lot of this, and and as it 
as it is often reflected in our permitting, um, depends on the information provided by an applicant. So, you know, we expect um, a level of engagement from applicants with the community. Um, we also expect, um, you know, applicants to provide us with complete information. The more complete information, the more thorough the analysis, uh, typically the quicker the permitting decision can be made. So I think it's a case by case basis. I don't know if I can give you a specific number at this point. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Thank next, you. next, we have Lee Clark. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for hosting this. This is a lot of information. Um, I only have two clarifying questions that I was just wondering about. Sure. Uh, regarding the geographic point of comparison and existing conditions uh, comparison with that, I was looking at the stressor of trucks and I was just wondering how would you go about measuring the truck stressor? Is it a matter of how many trucks the facility would be bringing on or is it a matter of how many emissions they would be giving off such as NOx, black carbon, how exactly would that stressor be measured? Sure. So, so we'll have a baseline stressor that that deals with the with um, the number of trucks in a given OBC. We'll be looking at vehicle mile, miles traveled and, and doing our best to quantify that. When an applicant comes in and it's assessing the impacts of its of potential truck traffic to a particular um, OBC from its operations, it would then be looking at the specific stressors we've listed and make and doing an analysis of how those particular trucks and their emissions would would contribute to those stressors. So if you use two if you use PM 2.5 as an example, um, you know, I think we would expect a level of mobile source model, modeling um, that would go through how how um, much time those trucks are spending in an OBC and how that additional PM um, would impact the um, the geographic point of comparison and the stressor level for PM and then it would work through the rest of the process. OK. Um, thank you for that. And uh, so, it's my last uh, question of clarification. And I might be reading this wrong, so I just want to make sure. But in the case of avoiding stressors for facilities, uh, like for the example, instead of cutting down trees, you could either make no change or plant additional trees. This isn't something where it says like you can build more if you compensate somewhere else. Like you can plant more trees here on site or over somewhere else in town, and then that will kind of subsidize the difference of your building construction. Does that kind of make sense? We're look yeah, so we're looking specifically on site, right? So so that so when you're looking at avoidance, we want to consider whether you have to cut the trees down in order to accomplish because we can't deny it. We can't deny it. we're talking an expansion, we can't deny the permit, right? We can condition it. And what we want to do is minimize any impact, avoid where we can and minimize any impacts. So we're gonna look at whether um, whether clearing vegetation in this particular instance trees um, is is unavoidable. If it is if it is unavoidable for whatever reason, we're gonna look at ways to minimize that. So if you're looking at, you know, I'm going to cut a tree down here and I'm going to um, add trees somewhere else. I don't think given the given the um, the value of trees that it's not a one to one minimizing that, um, you know, you're going to you're going to go through that analysis, but it's going to strictly be on site. Um, property and then plant trees somewhere else in the in the OBC. That's not what we're getting at. What we're getting at is specific and um, we're a specific property um, or facility analysis. OK, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Lee. Uh, next, we have Dr. Ana Baptista. Thanks, Olivia. Um, I, I just want to, on slide 50 and 51, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood what you're saying, since, since your examples were for renewals and and expansions, but for a new facility in an OBC, if you have a CST that's higher than the geographic point of comparison, that's a denial according to the law. Am I correct? Well, we're going to. That's the next topic, and we'll walk. We'll walk you through. Okay. So, and then for on, on slide fifty-one, where it's lower, where the CST is lower, mm -hmm. and you move through this process where you say, okay. Um, the applicant has to determine, you know, whether assess whether a facility will contribute to existing stressors. Um, you know, at that point, are you looking at individual yes. stressors? Okay, yes. so you're not saying that you have to move the whole CST score. The average, the whole CST average has to, to go up. You're going to be looking at individual um, stressors. I, I'm just trying to understand at, if there's and, and what 
under what con circumstances would a CS, uh, an overburdened community that sees an applicant but has a lower CST um, and then they have stressors or group of stressors that have unavoidable emissions mm -hmm. or impacts. Um, is that grounds enough for a denial or what would have to be the grounds or the types of evidence presented um, to show, short of showing the whole, I, mean, I think it would be really hard to move the whole CST score because you have so many stressors in there that you know will be hard to move. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to know if you're going you're to say a little bit more about what you're thinking about for how you're going to do that assessment or what, what maybe is in the supplemental materials um, that would help you figure that out. Okay. So I think when we're looking at, when we're looking at the, at a, a block group where the, where the combined stressor total is lower, we are looking at, um, at a different path where a particular facility is not going to ultimately change the combined stressor total. I think what I'm hearing for you is you think that's you think that's a shortcoming and so I mean you're going to think about talk about that more. Um, but that's that's the direction that we're that we're talking about here is looking at the contributions to individual stressors and making a determination about whether that changes the combined stressor total where where it's lower. Um, you know so that that's a specific analysis and then I think as part of the environmental justice impact statement those supplemental materials we're going to be considering um, other relevant data, so you're going to be looking at at um, something broader than stressors, and it's hard to specifically, um, you know, identify what what that could look like because I feel like that's just there's like infinite permutations of what type of information we could be provided with, so it's difficult for me to say at this particular moment what would or wouldn't result in a denial. Um, we will talk more um, as we get into compelling public interest what it looks what that analysis looks like for a new facility. Um, but it would largely track what we've gone through so far um, with some tweaks because of the different authorities that department has. Happy to talk talk through it further with you, Doctor. Okay, thank you, Dr. Baptista. Um, I'm going to ask at this point, everyone who has your hand raised, keep it raised, we will get to you. Um, but we only have six slides left and I want to make sure that before eight o'clock we get through this full presentation. So I want to hand it back to Sean to go through the full presentation and then we'll take all the questions that remain at once. Thank you, Olivia. I think we will have we will have a couple minutes at the end. Um, so let me just find find my place. All right, so we're talking about compelling public interest now. So this is this is a situation where we're dealing with um, with new facilities um, seeking to be constructed in an overburdened community. So. Um, what the bill says, where disproportionate impact exists, the department shall deny a permit for a new facility, except where the department determines that a new facility will serve a compelling public interest in the community where it is to be located. The department may grant a permit that imposes conditions on the construction operation of the facility to protect public health. So um, ultimately, the compelling public interest um, definition that we come up with will be modeled after informed by what we use in the Freshwater Wetlands Protection Act. Um, it's compelling public need, but you can see some of the things that you're talking about here um, we're talking about specific facts. We're talking about health and safety, um, and we're talking about um, targeting that to the overburdened community, as we've talked about many times. Um, so next slide. So what, what we're thinking about here for compelling public interest is a, a focus on specific types of facilities, public works types projects that serve a compelling public interest in the overburdened community. Again, double, triple underlines under the overburdened community this is a very specific analysis and one targeted at um, at the specific benefits brought to the community where this where the facility is seeking to be located examples of things that could be considered um, non exhaustive but th but things that we've heard from our stakeholders so far thus far uh, things like appropriately scaled food waste facilities public water infrastructure renewable energy facilities um, we could consider other facilities that meet essential public um, health and safety needs of the overburdened community or specifically reduced stressors um, like a particular facility that is um, you know intended to uh, to address uh, contamination or to specifically reduce combined sewer overflows. These are things that um, are on our mind, not wanting to um, to dissuade beneficial things, but also recognizing that this this particular um, definition needs to be appropriately um, keyed to the overburdened community, so that it doesn't create an inadvertent loophole to the protections required by the by the law. Um, we're not going to be looking at an economic justification, economic benefits as a justification for compelling public interest. We're focusing on the specific facility 
and what it brings to a community from a public health and environmental perspective. Um, we'll also be considering whether there's a significant degree of public interest in the Oberlin community in favor of opposition to the facility, understanding that, um, you know, that when appropriately considered, um, there is a public, there is a, uh, there's a self-determination aspect to this. We wanna make sure that we're hearing the voices of the folks in the Oberlin community and ultimately meeting their needs. Um, compelling public interest has to be connected to the needs of the, of the community. We wanna make sure we hear those needs directly from the people um, most, most connected to these particular operations so that we can accurately assess um, the uh, the opposition or desire for any particular facility. Um, when you're looking at when you're looking at a compelling public interest analysis, um, let's look at what we would what we would think. So, compelling public interest, as we indicated, where where that combined stressor total is higher than um, than the geographic point of comparison, the facility is to avoid contributions. If it can't avoid contributions to the stressors where the where the CST is higher, um, then the then the the application is denied unless it's compelling public interest. If it is a compelling public interest, it is a particular facility that meets the compelling public interest standard. That is one that will serve a compelling public interest in the in the overburdened community. Um, we would look at conditions similar to what we were looking at for expansions. We'd be looking at measures to avoid those contributions to the individual stressors in OBC. We would then look be looking where avoidance is not feasible for minimization of contributions to individual stressors that are higher than the geographic point of comparison. We'd also be looking at potential additional feasible conditions that again are in the same order as we laid out for the um, for the renewals. Um, ones that reduce like stressors from offsite sources, to reduce other stressors from offsite sources in the overburden community. Again, preference from highest to lowest stressor levels, trying to get the things that are um, that are most acutely affecting a community. Um, and then lastly, things that might provide a net environmental benefit that improves baseline environmental and public health stress in the Oberlin community. These are conditions that are placed on a permit after it meets the compelling public interest standard. They're not they're not intended to be conditions that justify compelling public interest, which is why we've been very careful, we think, in our in our approach to make sure that we're focusing on a particular facility and the benefits that it might provide to the community. So that is the um, that's the end of the, the slides proper. I know we have some questions, so I want to leave some time for folks to uh, Folks have talked to us for the last 10 minutes or so we have left. Um, and just want to thank everybody again for uh, for their engagement um, and the very kind words for a not all that great presentation. So thank you. Sean, you are very modest. I'm kidding. <laughs> so next we will have uh, Ray Cantor. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, thank Olivia. You. Um, I just want to echo earlier comments that this has been an excellent um, uh, series of stakeholder meetings, one of the best I've ever been participating in. No matter what the outcome, at least we can't fault the process. The process has been uh, excellent. Um, th there was a lot of detail here tonight, and I'm not going to ask a question because it won't be intelligent enough to get, you know, to be able to get the answer that I want. What I'm asking you though is if you could post these slides as soon as possible so we have time to go through it in more detail and be able to send you in additional comments or thoughts. Without question, absolutely. And I, I appreciate, uh, appreciate the kind words. I appreciate the recognition of the process. And I also appreciate that it's nearly impossible for folks to digest 70 slides worth of information that summarizes five five meetings worth of um, worth of conversations in one evening. So we look forward to hearing more from everyone post this so we can you know, accurately gauge reactions to this particular presentation in the direction we've set. So thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Uh, next we have John Valeri. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sean. And then uh, without reiterating fully, thank you again. I, I echo what Ray said on the process. I think this has been very thorough. Um, Question relates to the slide relating to the existing facility and the air permit uh, example. Mm -hmm. um, for facilities that are do have where the stressors are looked at as being above uh, what's in the geographic area, um, and a facility that has uh, been constructed and is deemed to be constructed with the highest technologies, best available technology, uh, control technology, et cetera. Uh, you list also potential operational modifications. And I guess the question really focuses on that phrase and what that means. Could it potentially mean 
a reduction in what has already been permitted um, in its operate in, in, in its maximum or ability to operate. I think we'd want to assess. We, I mean, I think in those situations we'd be assessing operational needs and trying to bring those limits in line with operational needs. So I, I don't. I mean, I don't think we're we're necessarily, um, you know, like, yeah, looking to give people like a cushion that they're not using. But I think that's a case by case analysis. So I think we have to look at that. So you will be looking at. We want, case we want to ultimately, at you know, through this process, if we're going to better conditions in overburdened communities, we're going to need to. Um, to ultimately better operations for everybody. And I think that's part of the analysis. But I can't say specifically we tell you you need to, need to reduce um, your limits, but I think that's part of the conversation. And limits could mean not just emission limits, but also operational limits. Again, knowing what you just said, that it's a case-by-case -case analysis, but that is still a possibility. I can't exclude possibilities at this particular instance, John. Okay. But I understand what you're saying. I mean, I think I think this this analysis is new. Mm -hmm. It's going to be broad. We're going to learn lessons along the way in terms of what we can and can't expect applicants to do, and how we can and can't best um, best address the historic inequities through this through this regulations. So I think we're going to have to take it case by case. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Uh, next, we have Dr. Sheets. Thanks, Olivia. Can you hear me? We can. We certainly can. Um, thanks, Sean, for the presentation. Uh, I think uh, I think Ray and I are going to found found common ground on something that we that we're going to have to look at the slides and, and get back to you. <laughs> you Absolutely. Know, make sure we understand. Um, I have a clarifying question, then maybe a comment. Mm -hmm. If the number of stressors, total number of stressors, in the relevant block group is lower than the comparison block group. And um, so the process moves forward. Will a hearing be required? Yes. Yes. The we, you know, we our our view of the law is is that it clearly requires an environmental justice impact statement, which which clearly requires a public hearing and public comment. So even in situations where that's lower, um, if the facility is seeking a permit in an overburden overburden community, which is defined by that demographic criteria, um, there will be a public hearing and and public comment. Good, good. That wasn't clear to me, and I. Yeah, no, it, you're, you're right to ask that question. And my comment is just trying to think a little bit, and you know, we'll, we'll look at the slides to get back to you, and mm -hmm. and I've kind of made this comment before, and, and it kind of goes to what Professor Baptista was saying a little bit too. How you're dealing with those stressors that turn out to be lower in the block group in the comparison group, mm -hmm. because when when you when you do your what amounts to your total cumulative impact score, which is really adding up all the stressors, right? Yep. Those stressors that are lower are left out of that. Right? Yeah. So, so they, and, you know, and just make an observation to think about. Mm -hmm. But we know that in, in the real world, they are actually contributing to the cumulative impacts load in that community. But they're not being reflected in cumulative impact score, and I, you know, I, I, I just want to make that comment. I, I don't, you know, at the moment, I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's, but, but it, it, it you know, it, 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 it worries me a little bit, and, and it also struck me that when you said you have to submit supplemental mater material if the total cumulative impact score is higher than the comparison black group. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I have, you know, I haven't gone back and looked at the uh, slides. I didn't want to miss miss the other things you were saying <laughs> while I was looking, Sean. But I, I don't. I think it said that you didn't have to sh show that material didn't have to go to those stressors that were lower. Um, to see if to see if if the if granting the permit would make a contribution to those stressors, and you know, and that worries me a, a little bit because you don't. Even if the stresses are lower than the average, you don't want to increase them. Mm -hmm. You don't want the new facility to increase them because that, that could still harm people. So so just you know how we're dealing with those lower stressors, I, I just wanted to kind of flag that. And I think Anna was kind of getting at that too. That's something maybe to think about and talk about more. Yeah, no, I, I certainly expected that that was something that we were going to need to need to talk more about. So I, I appreciate that. 
and we've you know we're we're I think you know we'll say openly it's something we we're still we're still trying to work through ourselves in terms of how we address that in terms of how we, you know we ultimately conduct um, you know the comparison comparative or disproportionate analysis we think that the the statute requires but be happy to talk to that talk about you guys talk about that with you guys in further detail okay post, post tonight. You know, and and as comparison Dev, you just totaled all the stressors up somewhere and aggregated all the stressors and came up with a total cumulative impact score and then right. compared it you know this just thinking about those two variations okay yeah. thank you sean thank you doctor presentation thank you sir Thank you, Dr. Sheets. Next we have Toby Hanna. Hi, Olivia. Thank you again. Uh, nice to hear your voice, Nikki Sheets. Uh, always good insights. Uh, Sean, I wanted to bring up a topic I brought up on a couple of our calls that I didn't hear about tonight. It's the, the meaningful engagement. I know that's uh, that's underpinning all the legislation and, and the intent with the regulation here. But the opportunity to create more incentives for that, and and uh, and and give some maybe give some some credit for where it's really happening in an effective way. Just wanted to hear your thoughts uh, where you are today, thinking about where that fits in the overall rulemaking. Yeah, you know, it struck me as I'm going through this that we we probably gave that um, we won't, we spent a lot of time on some of these technical issues and some of this other stuff, and and really didn't focus on that as much as we should have tonight. I mean. You know, I think you're right. You're right that that's a that's an underpinning of the of the legislation. Obviously, extremely important in terms of how we do this, and we want to build it into the into the analysis. We want to ensure, um, you know, you know, full and complete engagement. And I think we're going to try to um, to put some things in the rules uh, to deal with that. But I don't necessarily have you know I don't have the details in front of me at this particular moment. So that may be something that. Um, that requires a little bit more conversation internally and externally. So I think we're going to need to think about that some more. Fair enough. Thanks, Sean. Absolutely. Thank you, Toby. Uh, next, we have Nicole Miller. Hi, sorry, I just need to unmute. And my daughter's unhappy that we left the park, so I'm going to try to get away from her. Um, Something we all got to late to. <laughs> um, so a couple questions, just following up on, I hate to belabor the point, but um, for layman's terms for what uh, Dr. Batista and, um, Batista and Sheets had asked with regard to those uh, facilities that are kind of below the threshold, will there still be recommendations um, to sort of like in help their facilities? If they don't call, especially for new, because there's a difference between new and expanding or renewal. So mm -hmm. for new facilities that um, do have impact, but don't meet the level of a denial, will there be recommendations um, to still help their help reduce their environmental impact uh, uh, before the the point of denial, um, as as will happen as what will happen with an expansion or a renewal, mm -hmm. is one question. And then um, the other is in response to my question from the chat, which was <laughs> about the asthma rates. And um, um, excuse me, uh, Miss Glenn actually answered it about. Uh, the New Jersey Department of Health um, statistics and uh, maintaining privacy, which is actually something that we've heard before with regard to getting asthma rates. I'm um, just, um, is, can someone speak to how we can have cancer rate risk and cancer rates, but not asthma rates? What's the difference with regard to um, 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 uh, you know, uh, being confidential, confidentiality. Sure. Um, so, uh, first, off, first to uh, to your first point on the recommendations, that's a that's a very interesting idea, and I think that's something um, I think that's something we're going to want to talk about more internally. I mean, what we're trying to do here, and I think what's come up, you know, from the from the questions from from the, from Dr. Sheets and Dr. Baptista, um, you know, is where you know where the department's attempting to you know to draw some line um, and to create a level of connection between. Um, stress on the the demographic criteria and how it might work through that. Um, 
so I think we're you know we're we're open to to thinking about better ways to approach that, um, and we'll certainly give that some thought. And the recommendations thing is frankly a good recommendation. Um, as far as the asthma rates, I mean, what we have, you know, the limitations we have from a data perspective, our ability to use that information um, that health um, the Department of Health has, and and the and the kind of confidentiality concerns certainly limits us. Um, our approach here is to is to address those present conditions that might contribute to that, which is why we're pointing to things like PM, um, looking at ozone, looking at a lot of those other particular conditions in overburdened communities um, to address um, to address that as best we can. Um, when you talk about the difference um, between the asthma data or the lack thereof and the particular cancer related stressor um, stressor levels that we're or stressor layers that we're looking at, um, the NADA cancer data is ultimately not based on actual cancer risk, right? It's not it's not based on a specific um, number of individuals. It's cancer risk based on air emissions. So you're effectively taking the known information about cancer risks, um, connecting it to the known information you have on on um, on emissions, and then drawing conclusions from that. So it's really it's a different it's a difference in data sets ultimately, in terms of how we have one and not the other. Um, but we're certainly not giving up. Um, at all um, on a long long term in terms of being able to to work with health to work with available um, you know with with folks who have that information to make it usable if we think that it's appropriate to be included at some later date um, as I've said I think a couple of different times potentially in these meetings um, you know this is this is our first shot at environmental justice rulemaking um, we're gonna we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do a little bit of a self-assessment and look back and see where there are places to improve um, and if we need to, if we need to appro um, propose amendments to adjust some of these stressor levels as we see how this thing plays out, we'll absolutely do so. As new data becomes available, if it is better than what we have, um, we'll adjust accordingly. So this is not the end of the journey by any stretch of the imagination. Thank you. I'm just going to note that there are three hands raised right now, and these are going to be the last three hands that we take this evening. Um, we've noticed that meeting attendance has already dropped by about 30 people, and so we're losing attendees. Um, but certainly, if you have any follow-up questions or concerns, uh, we will have a survey as we do for all meetings. We also have the email address that's right here on the slide of ejrulemaking at dep.nj.gov. Um, and if we happen to leave anything unanswered in the chat um, by the time we wrap up today, we promise you that we will come back to this um, and make sure that we answer everything. Uh, so with that, um, with the three hands we have left, we will take those. The next one being Natalie Augusto Filion. Oh, Olivia, I was worried you were going to call on me because I forgot my question. Can you go to someone else next? Because I had it and then I lost it. It'll come back. I promise it's only 8 p.m. Again, okay. something we can all relate to. <laughs> Definitely. Um, next, uh, Lee Clark. Uh, thanks, and I'll, I'll keep it quick. I, I know there's a lot of work still being done around uh, public engagement um, to inform neighborhoods about you know uh, steps going forward and hearings, so I, I won't go into too much detail regarding a question regarding that. But my, my only question was, um, as, as I lose my train of thought as I'm speaking, um, I, I definitely agree with uh, Dr. Sheets, Dr. Baptista, and uh, Nicole Miller uh, regarding the hearing process of how we can possibly um, influence uh, projects that make it under the radar. Um, but my question is, will DEP be looking to record and capture testimony at hearings? And if so, what what's the effect that you kind of see it having on influencing these projects that are now going before the public? And again, if you don't have an answer for it, it's perfectly fine. But it was just kind of rattling in my brain. No, I I think so. I think Lee, what one of that's a great question and a, and a really good point. Uh, so, you know, I think what we've learned, um, what has been really beneficial, and particularly in this engagement, right? We've been forced to do this engagement in a virtual environment, which is not what we expected. Um, but the recording and availability of these of these meetings, I think, has been beneficial to everyone. And I think that that's something that certainly could be um, included um, in this process so that folks who are not able to be at a particular meeting are able to to access the information, to see it presented in real time, um, which is obviously very different um, than just looking at a PowerPoint or looking at written information. So I think that that could have um, 
you know, really, really beneficial effects for public engagement. I think we're going to we're going to take that back um, and see how we might be able to um, to include that. You know, the department's role in engagement. You know, I think we talked about this um, during our last meeting. Got some really good feedback here. I think you know we're going to be um, we're going to be in these meetings in some capacity. Um, you know, we're going to set I think going to set ground rules and we're going to set expectations and help folks um, in the audience to understand what the purpose of those meetings are, what they should expect. Um, and what their what their um, you know effectively what their rights are in these particular permitting uh, situations. So, you know, we're going to be part of this. Um, we're going to make sure that the information that's given is accurate and clear. Um, but we're we're also going to do that in a way um, that makes this process um, as meaningful as possible to the folks in the communities. So, we don't want to have a chilling effect, but we also want to make sure that we're um, we're ensuring. Um, accuracy and completeness in the information that's provided. And we'll be Thank looking you. at that very closely. Thank you, Lee. Next, we will take Ray Pepperman. Hi, Olivia and Sean. Good to good to see you. Hey, um, you great job. Up. I won't waste people, you know, time and saying what a great job you did. Everybody else has told you already. Uh, my question, and I didn't think I was going to get called because it said lower my hand. I kept hitting the wrong icon at first. Um, anyway, my question had to do with, you know, I heard a lot about the process. I heard a lot about how you, you know, the calculations are being made, but I didn't hear very much about two things. Um, and that is in the decision-making process after the hearing stage, how the DEP, if there's going to be guidance or maybe it'll be something in the regulations as to how the DEP will be making their decisions. I understand it's going to be on a case by case basis, but is will there be flexibility? Will there be rigidity, you know, as there is in terms of developing the numbers? So I don't know how much you've talked about that or thought about it. I haven't sure. heard much about it. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good, good question. So we are, um, you know, so we're working on our public available data tool. We're going to pull all the data, data layers that we've discussed as part of our stressors together and make those public available. People can be able to use that. Um, tool can't mandate that. We're not going to mandate the use of our online tool, but we think it'll provide a very useful, um, you know, effectively shortcut and reliable way for everyone to access and look at that information. Um, the rules are going to have to reflect the level of flexibility in that. Um, and you know, if there's, you know, if there's another reliable way to reach this information that, um, you know, is frankly better than what we have on our on our um, on our tool, we're going to have to consider that. I don't expect that because of the level of rigor that we're going through, but if that's the case, we're certainly going to have to consider it. So there's there's some you know room for that in the regulations. We're also putting together um, you know what folks will find to be a pretty um, a pretty robust and, and clear basis and background document, which will explain the methodology um, and lay out how we'd how we have done our analysis. That will serve as a level of guidance for for folks in the regulated community to to draw from, and of course the proposal. Um, we'll outline, you know, our expectations as far as what this analysis should look like and what needs to be considered and how it should be conducted um, in the appropriate regulatory terms. So I think I think there'll be a bunch of different ways we'll get at this, um, um, and we'll be looking we'll be looking very closely at um, at ensuring clarity for all parties um, in how that analysis should be conducted. It is to nobody's benefit to to not do so. So thank you for asking. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And last but not least, Natalie, do you remember your question now? I nope. sure do. Thank you for your, for your patience with me. Um, my question, and, uh, and it, it's a little, I guess it's a little weighty for being the last question, um, not, not necessarily a quick one, but I just wanted to put it out there and we can sort of come back to it at some other point if it makes sense. One of the supplementary materials included the development of some kind of health summary or health assessment. And um, I'm curious, particularly with respect to the last five um, sort of additional public health assessors, the ones that follow the sort of um, classic EJ, um, race, ethnicity, uh, I think there was unemployment, there was like several things, education status, et cetera. Um, I'm curious about how that data, that the health data and then sort of the understanding of the population feeds into um, the usage of the, the cumulative impacts um, scoring, right? So what do I mean by that? If you're including in the 31 stressor, mm -hmm. something like the known contaminated site list, or even I can't remember if the groundwater um, classifications were also in your in your 31 stressors. Um, 
that's not a health protective data. That's data about status in a regulatory program. And so in some ways there's we're lacking the kind of um, exposure pathway relative to other uh, health stressors or stressors that you have where there's a very clear exposure pathways. So if it's groundwater contamination that's capped because there's a remedial action plan in place, that's less of a health risk as compared to some of the other stressors. And so I'm curious if you have a block group that has, for example, a lot of children living in poverty, then wouldn't you want to, I guess, include guidance or something for applicants that recognizes that sort of preliminary con population condition and health summary. Um, so if there's a lot of childhood asthma, then maybe those things are even like more like more stressed in the analysis. And I know, again, that that's a really big question when after, it's after Tate, um, but just wanted to throw it out there right now that I'm, I guess, slightly concerned about treating all of the stressors at the same way every time. Understood. So I I will as a big question and I'll try to answer it in as in a like a smaller way just for this particular moment. I'm happy to talk more. Totally so <laughs> ultimately, you know, the way we're approaching this is 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 comparatively, right? So we're trying to look at we're trying to look at this as, you know, what are the conditions in a particular block group? How can we identify the stressors that contribute to these things? And we're looking at it as compared to to non-overburden communities. So that's kind of the baseline, which is slightly different than looking at um, you know, as at an exposure based or, you know, a cumulative impacts type analysis. So that's, that's one thing. But, um, you know, the statute talks about, you know, the commissioner's ultimate decision, um, you know, taking into account the information presented at an environmental justice impact, um, you know, statement hearing, as well as other relevant information. There will be room within the regulations for the consideration of other relevant information, which might be some of the things that you've, you've outlined, Natalie. Some of the other things that, um, you know, that from a public health and environmental perspective, um, would be relevant to the ultimate decision the commissioner makes. What we aim to do is make as much of this objective um, publicly facing and publicly available as possible. But we don't think that the regulations or the statute um, will preclude, um, you know, providing or considering things um, in that ultimate decision. So, you know, we're going to try to have it both ways. Um, we're going to try to make it predictable, but we also recognize that um, no one can predict everything. So there has to be some room for information to be provided by an applicant or by members of the community um, that will be relevant to the decision. So I hope that at least partially answers the question. Um, and I think at this point, um, we're kind of done. Um, I, just, I appreciate it. Sorry? It's helpful. I appreciate it. Okay. So I, you know, for my part, um, like just overwhelmingly thankful for the engagement and the questions and um, the kindness that folks have shown us over these last eight months. Um, it has been a privilege uh, to present these things to you from my garage and now my office um, and to go through these presentations um, and to really learn um, so much more than I would have really known um, without having the benefit of being part of this process. So I am extremely grateful um, and I we look forward to taking this rule to proposal ultimately to adoption and putting something in place that um, that satisfies the goals um, that we've laid forth for ourselves. We recognize that we're the first ones to do this um, and with great, great, with great um, power comes great responsibility. And we take that very, very seriously. So I will just say thank you um, for the millionth time. And I look forward to, uh, to continue to work with all of you on this and in many other ways in our time together. So Olivia, as I've said it, everyone, I think we've worn them out or worn ourselves out. Um, so I will give it to you to close. Thank you so much, Sean, for that remarkable job that you did. And we want to thank everyone for their um, very supportive comments to us, as well as what we've seen written in the chat. Um, but we certainly cannot take full credit uh, for the work that we have done and certainly that Sean has done over these past five meetings. So tonight, with this being the final public stakeholder meeting, we wanted to ask the team that has been working with us behind the scenes to turn on their cameras so that they can be seen by all of you. So if that whole crew could turn their cameras on, this is our rule writing team. So you see a number of faces that are just popping up now. Julia Wong, Steve Anderson, Melissa Abadamarco, Armando Alfonso, Rache Outlaw, Ryan Kanapik, 
And is there anyone else who I missed that I did not see on my screen? Who else has been behind the scenes? Did Steve you get the Anderson. Great Steve Anderson? The oh, there's Steve. Steve is there. Mike Gordon. Mike, Mike Gordon. Gordon. I can't Rip see. Sherry. Rip Sherry. Sherry Driver. Christine Schell. Nadia Akbar. Nadia. There's many, 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 many people to go in that go into us talking for two hours. They do all the hard work. We just get to sit here. So we're eternally yes. grateful for their work. Hi, Thanks. Dr. Jacqueline McBride Jones. Hey, Doc. All right, thank you so much, everyone. And if there were any additional questions that were placed in the chat, we will be certain to follow up on those. And uh, pretty shortly, we'll be posting uh, tonight's recording on our website along with the survey as usual. So we look forward to your continued feedback and thank you again so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Everybody. Olivia, y'all should get a screenshot. Be, screen. be well and be safe. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thanks, care. Everybody. Bye bye. Have a good night. Thank you. So wonderful. Yeah. <laughs>